بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين اللهم إني نويت التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك في كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير إغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم يا الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله وي Uh, begin today the second uh, peril uh, Imam al-Ghazali al Imam al-Ghazali um, refers to as al-Athar uh, al-Thaniya um, in our last week's um, gathering we spoke about um, al-Athar al-Ula the first peril which was to um, refrain from speaking about matters that don't concern us and the Imam gives us a, a, a whole inventory of, of things that we should refrain from speaking about and also gives us clear examples um, and what we mentioned last week was reading the Ahya Ulum uh, al of Al-Imam Al-Ghazali one is struck by the fact that it's, it's a book that rearranges the way that you think It's a book that rearranges the way that you speak, the way that you live, everything about us. It completely transforms our paradigm. And that's the mark of a great book. Um, when we read it, it completely changes our worldview. And that's what we notice as we're going through some of the perils. We won't be able to cover the entire text. Is that the things that we ordinarily thought about as being... Um, okay for us to engage in um, we quickly realize that w not only is it the case that we shouldn't be speaking about those things but what is it that the Imam actually is trying to get at why would it be the case that the scope or the the the, uh, the safe space within which we should be engaging is is really this this small space Now, just to make clear, as the Imam said last week, as what the Imam is always saying, but as we said last week about what the Imam said, is that if you speak about things that are not of concern to you, from amongst those things are things that you're not going to be sinful for. So that's just to make that clear. And the Imam does say that, as he's going to say today. He's talking about those people who fully recognize the purpose of why we're here. And someone who recognizes the purpose of why they're here will very quickly come to recognize that it's better for me not to say anything except in certain instances which are sanctioned by Allah and His Messenger And essentially those that we can see in the exemplars from the companions and, and others. Now, what does this tell us about speech? There's something very unique about speech. If two human beings were to sit opposite each other and just look at each other, there's something that you can learn from the other person just by looking at them, just by observing them, just by being with them. Sometimes you tend to get a feeling from someone when you meet them. They don't have to say anything. It's either a good feeling, or you're unsure about something, or God forbid you may not have a good feeling about something. But you can say things without saying them, as the saying goes in English. <coughs> What does that mean? It means that there's something about us as human beings wherein we can convey without the need to speak. That's number one. But also that speech is only really meaningful when it comes from a place that's meaningful. Because speech really isn't something that comes from the tongue. The tongue is just the vehicle that carries our speech. Speech is not on the tongue. As Imam Ghazali says, that Allah جَعَلَ اللِّسَانَ دَلِيلًا عَلَى مَا فِي الْفُؤَادِ That Allah has made the tongue a sign for what's actually in the heart. 
The tongue is just a, a means by which we convey what's inside us. This is a phenomenal concept if you really thought about it, reflected on it. Because the way that we're able to communicate with each other, and not just with each other, but the, the things that we can communicate, complex ideas, there's nothing else in existence in, in the creative world here that can do that. Now, think about instances in our lives where we come across people and they're truly affected by what they say and yet we can hear the same thing from other people but it doesn't really affect us in the same way. Why? Same stories. We can hear the same stories from different people. One person's going to affect us, the other person's not. Why? Because what they're saying is coming from a place where the things that we want to mean, that's where they're emanating from. Whereas for everyone else, it's just coming from their tongue. When it comes from a tongue, it will never penetrate the heart. But when it comes from the heart, it will always penetrate under the person's heart. So what's Imam Ghazali really trying to tell us? That if you were to really work on the things that you say and recognize the things that are meaningful and have value, you'll realize that it takes such a huge amount of labor and effort to get to that point that you won't have much to say anyway. Because to really want to convey something meaningful, it takes a lot of time and effort to think about it. So they can take an example where meaningful things are said. Let's say start from the worldly aspect. You're going for a job interview. You're just not going to turn up unprepared. If you are, the person who's interviewing you very quickly will recognize, yeah, he's not prepared. I'm not going to give him the job. You've not given that, that instance any meaning. What's, what, what's the best way to do it? To prepare. When we've prepared people to go for interviews in places, uh, university interviews, how much time did we take? Weeks and weeks and scenarios and questions and how, what, and what were we really saying? We weren't preparing them in memorizing answers, we're preparing them how to think about the meaning of what they're saying. Now look how much time it took us for a one hour interview to prepare our minds to say something meaningful. That's what the Imam is saying. That if, if we're really going to, if it's necessary for you to speak, at least speak about things that you've spent time thinking about and you've recognized that there's some meaning to them. And in that context, then we can see, oh, now I understand why the Imam is saying that just speak about things that, have, that, that, that matter to you. Because in that sense, the things which are not directly related to you, why should you be speaking about them anyway, as we said last week? Many a time there are that we may want to, the great example of Luqman alayhi salam. He could have asked Dawud alayhi salam about what he was making. One year he visited him and never asked him that. He could have, but he didn't. It's an example of something. That's why he's called Al-Hakim, the wise one. And so today the Imam is wanting to speak about the second peril is what's in Arabic, Fudul al-Kalam. We can translate this as me just being something which is, in, in relation to speech, excessive speech. Now what's interesting is we have the same word in Urdu, which gives us a, a proximity to the meaning of this word, Fuzul. When, when we want to say to someone, you know, Fuzul but then we say, don't, don't, don't engage in things that are not, that are, that are, in fact, in, in our language, in Urdu, Fuzul doesn't just mean excessive, it means something which is of little value. It's not needed. It's, you know, children don't even speak about that type of stuff. Right? And that's ex partly what the Imam is, is, is trying to convey here, because when the, the, the root meaning in the Arabic language of the word Fadl, because Fadl in Arabic we say, Hada min Fadlillah, this is from the Fadl of Allah. How can the word fadl, which is bounty, have the same meaning as something which is excessive? Because the idea is that a bounty is excessive. In what way? Because there's nothing that we've done to deserve it. So it's an excess of our actions. Because if we say, oh, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me this bounty because of all the great things I've done. Well, if we were to enumerate our actions and... and correspond them one-to-one -one with the reward that we get for them, 
not a single one of our actions will correspond to the immense reward that we get for it. There's nothing that we can do that can, that can amount to that. Nothing. Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran tells us that were you to try to enumerate one of my blessings, you'll never be able to do so. And so fadl truly is that concept. It's, it's, it's putting us in a state of thinking wherein we're recognizing that no matter what it is that we do, nothing that we do is going to be worthy of the, of the recompense that I get from Allah. It's everything He gives me is far beyond what I do for Him. It's not even a comparison. So that's why in Arabic we refer to the fadl of Allah as being a bounty because there's no correspondence, there's no one-to-one relation between our acts and His reward. Now, the first thing that the Imam tells us, he says that excessive, excessive speech is, is blameworthy. And he says that whenever uh, we speak about a matter that doesn't concern us, we can either discuss, sorry, that does concern us, we can either discuss it in a concise manner, or we can either discuss it in a manner that's too lengthy or repetitive. Now, there is a type of repetition that's good, because the Prophet ﷺ would repeat what he would say three times for clarity, so that no one would make a mistake in what he said. And incidentally, that's a very important point of conveyance that we tend to forget, that when we, when we hear things from someone, and if that thing needs to be conveyed to someone else, we must convey it in the exact words that we hear it. We've got this um, fascinating skill wherein we change the words into words that weren't said by someone. We can't take something that someone says and change the words. Because words have different meanings, as you know. If the person who's, especially teachers or someone who's thought about what they're saying, if they say something, they said it with hopefully those words in mind and not any other words. And someone changing those words is changing what they're meaning. It's not what they intend. And there's many examples of this in our day-to-day life, I should say. And so what the Imam is saying is that to, to go to great lengths when something that could be conveyed in fewer words is an error. In fact, he says that whenever one word or two words can suffice, then the third word is excessive. And anything that goes beyond that is blameworthy, even if there is no sin or harm involved. So he's making that very clear. If you are going to say something, and instead of saying it in three words, you said it in 15, it doesn't mean that there's sin in those 15 words. He's talking about cultivating habits. Because if you cultivate habits in your speech which are not good, ultimately they're going to manifest in habits of character which are not good. That's the thing about the Imam. He's always trying to cut off avenues. That's the the mark of a great thinker. That they're recognizing that, okay, I'm not worried about the fact that this is a sin, but I'm worried about the fact that if you engage in this thing in this way, it may four steps down the line lead you to some sin. Because once you get used to talking, you may feel the need to keep the conversation going. You don't want to stop. You're the, you know, silence between people is a bit awkward sometimes. You look at each other and, okay, is that it? Should we finish here? No, silence is a good thing. Silence is a a moment for reflection about what's been said. But if you get into the habit of saying or or conveying something with, with excessive speech, what's going to happen? is that you're now going to feel that it's incumbent upon you to keep talking. And what does that mean now? You have to now start filling in those moments of silence with anything that comes to your mind. And sometimes then what's going to happen is you're going to end up speaking about things which are not just, you're not sinful for them, but you're moving into the doubtful areas. And once you move into the doubtful areas, what does the Prophet ﷺ tell us? Man waqa'a fi shubuhat, waqa'a fi haram the one who falls into doubtful matters will fall into haram. It's just a matter of time. That's the buffer. People think that the, that the buffer 
i.e. doubtful things, okay, then you may not be sinful for them directly, or always. So that's my buffer. I can keep just going into them and popping in and out like that. No. The buffer is there so you don't go into the buffer. They said that the companions would leave 90% of things which are permissible for them out of fear of falling into that which was doubtful, not haram. 90%, 9 tenths. In fact, there's a saying here of the companion which is hard for us to even sort of think about. What does, he, what does the, 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 the Sahabi say here? That the Imam narrates that one of the companions would ask, was asked once and he said that truly a man would speak to me about some matter to which a response is more desirable to me than cold water is to a thirsty person. So someone's asked me something and me responding to them, that response is more valuable than water is to a thirsty person. But I don't respond out of fear of being excessive. <coughs> the companion's mindsets are very alien to us. And as I said many, many times before, if you look at the lives of the companions, they're very unsettling for us. Because all of a sudden we come to realize that, yeah, maybe, maybe our purpose that's, that we're really supposed to be here, that we are here for, we're not really serving it properly enough. We're not giving it its due. They say the companions, when grey hair would appear in their bed, they would take themselves away from the world, prepare for death. That's it. We've had our time in this world. For us, that's not even a frame. Grey hair is a sign that let's get going. It's the beginning of the next phase. For them, the greys are a reminder that death is just down, it's, it's here now. It's not far away at all. What are we using it for? So again, the companions are a marker, they're a yardstick for us. The more that we look into the lives of the companions and the more comfort we feel, it's a good sign. And it's also a good sign when you look into the lives of the companions and we may say, okay, we're not doing that, but I would love to do that. That's also a good sign. Because the first sign of change is wanting to make the change and also loving the people that we want to be like. Rather than looking at the companions and saying, oh, but that's them. Or that was at that time. No, they were that time for us. The companions are not time-bound people because the, the companions live according to principles. And principles aren't coded in time. Principles transcend time, transcend space. If the companions weren't living according to principles, then we would have no need for what they lived by. But we know what they lived by was a code of conduct. And the code of conduct transcends any time and space. And so the Imam tells us here that um, the companions, that they would they would consider excessive speech to be anything other than these four things. They considered excessive speech to be speaking about anything other than the Book of Allah, the Quran. And of course, that's, it's, that's a huge thing, you know, because the Quran contains guidance, it contains reminders, it contains glad tidings and warnings, it contains, again, code of conduct, it tells us about generations that came before, many, many things. So there's so much that you can speak about in terms of the Qur'an. So the first thing is the Qur'an. The second, the Sunnah of the Prophet And again, that is what we, what we refer to as Dustur. That is, our, that is our code of living. We could spend lifetime speaking about the Prophet and his, and his, and his seerah and his life, and we wouldn't exhaust it. So we needn't have to worry here that, oh, there's only a few things that we can speak about. In fact, there's so much that we can speak about. Number three, that if you weren't enjoining good or forbidding evil. Now, just to be clear here, enjoining good and forbidding evil doesn't necessarily mean that you say it to people. Don't do that and do this. In fact, in, on many an occasion, it's probably not the right way to do it. To go around telling people, don't do this and you should be doing that. The way that you, the, the, the optimal way is, as we said many times, through one's good character. If you live a life of conduct, you will convey a life of good conduct. That's the third thing, the third category. And the fourth is anything that relates to your livelihood which you cannot avoid. So if you happen to work in, if you're a car salesman, 
well, you need to know about cars and car parts and you need to speak to people and whatever, if you work in sales or if you work in recruitment or if you work as a lawyer or if you work, whatever it may be that you do, you have to speak to people about what you do. Otherwise, how are you going to be successful? So that is not considered uh, to be um, excessive speech. So there's four categories that the Imam gives us. The Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, commanding good or enjoining good, I beg your pardon, and forbidding evil, and anything that relates to your livelihood which you cannot avoid. These four are, the, he, he, he says that they're safe categories. Again, just to repeat, it doesn't mean that if you step outside of these categories that you're in sin. No, he's not saying that. He's talking about the optimal way of what we should be aiming towards. Where our journey should be. Our journey in life should be moving towards not becoming wealthier and, and all those different things. Our journey in life should be towards becoming people of, of, of finer character. People who, when, you know, uh, one of the du'as that we should have certainly should be, Oh Allah, that when you take us, take us to you, i.e. When, when we die, that we are awliya. We are the, the great saints. Who would not want to be a saint before they leave this world? And so it should be a, a, a call that we have every time that we think of our death, that, oh Allah, give us a good ending, and that when you take us, take us as awliya. Take us that you are pleased with us. That reconfigures the way that we journey in this world then. And so what the Imam says then, is that it truly would be a matter of shame and embarrassment if knowing that Allah has deputized angels to write down our good deeds and our bad deeds that when we when we come to meet with Allah and we pre- and our record of actions is presented to Allah that all that's there in front of us is the content of our lives that had nothing to do with deen or the dunya i.e. the permissible dunya he said, how can you how can you want to stand in front of Allah with your with your record openly in front of you and it's just excessive speech or God forbid even backbiting ill thoughts about other people ill gained wealth cheating theft horrible you know things that we ask Allah to keep us safe from so this is truly a, a matter of great shame and embarrassment if that's what our our records show in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. and so one of the great uh, people of this deen said that in, in order for the glory for the majd of Allah to enter your heart do not mention um, the following to anyone things such as Allah disgrace that person you know when you have feuds with someone or you don't get on with them not getting on with someone doesn't mean that you think ill of them or speak ill of them or wish ill of them it just means you don't get on <laughs> It's fine. It's perfectly okay not to be best friends with everyone. And if there are people that you're going to come across that there's a bit of tension, it doesn't work out, that's okay. But they have rights over you still. Never forget that. The person you don't get on with still has rights over you. Why and how? You can't speak ill of them. You can't think ill of them. And you can't wish ill for them. In fact, it should be the opposite. What we should be doing is wishing well for the people that we don't get on with. And that's the basic right that they have. And so what the Imam is saying here is that just as you wouldn't say any of those words such as Allah disgrace such and such, you wouldn't say that to a, a dog or a donkey or about a dog or a donkey. A human being is more honorable and honored. So why would we want to even think about saying anything like that? It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful um, piece of wisdom that the, the great Imams, they fill our hearts with. Again, just to repeat, it's okay not to get on with someone. But, you know when you say you have rights of friendship, you actually have the rights of not getting on. It's a bizarre concept if you think about it. It's counterintuitive. What do you mean that the person I don't get on with, there's rights in that relationship? Because even there's rights of friendship. Your friend has this right over you. Your parents have this right over you. Well, the person you don't get on with has a right over you. That's a frame that maybe we haven't thought about before. But this is exactly what the Imam is telling us. They are protected by the sanctity of them being a human being. You can't transgress that. 
Just because you don't get on with them doesn't mean that you can say things or think things or wish ill things for or about them. Now, so we're told this, uh, and look what Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran. In the Quran, Allah Azza wa tells us, "A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim." لا خير في كثير من نجواهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين الناس. Now I'll translate that in a moment, but this is this is to say that everything the Imam is saying in this chapter relates back to what Allah Azza wa Jal is actually saying in the Quran. And what what's that? What Allah says that there is no good in most of your secret talks. لا خير في كثير من نجواهم Except those that encourage charity and those that encourage kindness or those that reconcile between people. And whoever does this seeking Allah's pleasure, we will grant them a great reward. This is a Quranic injunction. It's an encouragement from the Quran itself. So this chapter is reflective of this ayah in the Quran that most of what people say ends up not being of much value. Right? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, "Tuba liman amsak al-fadla min lisanihi wa anfaq al-fadla min malihi." Now the Prophet ﷺ, it's I've said this many times before, and I will inshallah say it many times hereafter. When you read about the, when you read the hadith, whenever I'm about to teach hadith and I'm I'm preparing the lesson, I often sit down and I think to myself, I just don't understand this. Because the word has such profound depth and meaning that it's it's disservice to say I'm preparing a class on hadith. That's what I came to recognize. You can't prepare a class of hadith. You have to live the class of hadith. If you're not living it, you can't prepare it. Because preparing it, you're thinking, yeah, what does? It's true. You come and stuck. Unless you're living it, you can't teach it. And so what does the Prophet ﷺ say here? It's, it's, it's stunning. In, in one sentence, in the most eloquent form of Arabic, he sums up the human condition. Tuba liman amsak al-fadla min lisanihi wa anfaq al-fadla min malihi. Blessed is the one who refrains from being excessive in relation to his tongue. And, but rather is excessive in relation to giving from his wealth. The Arabic is it's, it's, an, it's incredible how it's, it's conveyed in Arabic. Why? Because in Arabic, the word which the Prophet ﷺ uses is fadl. Now, fadl is excess. And so the Prophet ﷺ says, Tawbah liman amsak al-fadla min lisani. Lisan is your tongue. And amsaka means to, to grab it. Don't let it go. So... Th- Blessed is the one who grabs his tongue from the excesses of the tongue, from the fadl of the tongue. And blessed is the one, man anfaq al min malihi, the one who gives the fadl, the excess from his wealth. It's a beautiful symmetry in the, the, the message which the Prophet is trying to convey to us. And as you know, that the Prophet is referred to as Juwami uh, al-Kalib that Allah gave the Prophet salam the miracle of, of in his speech where he was able to, con- to convey deep meanings with few words oceanic meanings with few words if you look at the hadith they are pithy not a single word is wasted you'll have an entire life lesson in one line an entire life lesson in two lines Sometimes an entire life lesson in two words. Someone came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, give me some advice. He said, لا تضدد. Don't become angry. The person repeated it. Advise me. لا تضدد. Said it again. The third time. Can you give me some advice? لا تضدد. <laughs> two words. The, 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 many examples of this. The Prophet ﷺ says, told us, الدين النصيحة. The deen is sincere counsel. That's it. How many times have we, you know, there are just books written on these two words, volumes or in commentary. That how Allah Azza wa Jal gave the Prophet salam this gift. Now think about it. What does, that, what does that tell us? 
It tells us, as I said right at the beginning, it will penetrate your heart if it comes from the heart. And if it comes from the heart and you've thought about it, you don't need to use excessive words. Everything that Prophet ﷺ said came from his heart. And because he knew what he was saying, he didn't need extra words. That's what Al Imam Shafi, what did he say? Imam Shafi he said, La yuhibu bil lugha illa nabi. That the only person that can that can comprehend language is a prophet. The only person that can, the only being that can comprehend language is a prophet. Because think about it, if I want to convey an idea, okay, I can say this is a mic, right? This is a pen. It's easy, these are corresponding exactly. I'm not having to use any extra description. This is a pen, it's a black pen, this is a table. So far we're on safe ground. As soon as you want to start conveying ideas and concepts, you move on to tricky ground now. It's hard to convey exactly what we what we want to convey. It takes a lot of effort to think about what it is that we're trying to say and to find the exact words. Now that's why a lot of people find it hard to write essays in universities. Why? Because they're not able to convey on paper what it is that they want to put on there. And because it takes such a huge amount of effort to actually sit and think, what am I trying to say? Then oh, I don't want to do it. <laughs> Leave it. <laughs> I'd rather just, you know, and before the deadline, I'll just put anything together and submit it. It's hard. So what we're seeing here is that to put words together that they match exactly our intent is one of the hardest things that a human being can do. And if you're truly working on that, again, you'll realize there's not really a lot for you to say. And that's why then we see that when the Prophet ﷺ says anything, that whatever he says perfectly corresponds to what he wants to say. And because it perfect, perfectly corresponds to what he wants to say, there is never an excess word. You will not see in the... They say that we could count the words of the Prophet ﷺ. If anyone sat in the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ, they would say that we could count his words. If you read a seerah, read the seerah, uh, this is a, you know, an open invitation to all of us. If you read the seerah, you could probably count the number of words that are directly attributed to the Prophet ﷺ in the book of seerah. What is the seerah mostly about? His character, his actions. That's the seerah. The seerah is not a book of, and then the Prophet ﷺ said this, and then he said this, and then he... Of course it's part of the seerah. But most of the seerah is descriptions about how he acted in scenarios and situations. What his response was. Very rarely do we see much by way of speech. And when we do find speech, we find that it's short. So if you took a one volume book of seerah and just compiled the words of the Prophet ﷺ, what, it would come to ten pages? Think about that for a moment. You're speaking about the biography of the greatest being to ever walk this earth and books that are written about him in volumes contain maybe no more than 10 pages about the words that he actually said. And the rest of the, wo the, 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 work, the book is about what? About his character, about his actions. Compare that to other biographies. It's all about what I want to say and very little about what I actually do. Can you see the inverse relationship between uh, prophecy? And so what does the Imam say in, in commenting on this hadith? That blessed are the ones who refrain from being excessive in relation to their tongue, uh, but are excessive in relation to giving from, his, from, from their wealth. That the Imam says, he says, but look at how people have inverted this today. They hold back in being excessive with their wealth while they give their tongue free reign in being excessive. It's the complete opposite now. And this is a thousand years ago. That now we have it that in, in relation to your wealth, no, I'm, I'm going to hold on to it. In relation to my tongue, let it run free. No problem. In other words, in complete uh, disparity um, and discord uh, with, the, with, the, with the message of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, and now look at this. There was this, this uh, episode narrated about the Prophet ﷺ by Mutarrif bin Abdullah, who said that he narrates this on the authority of his father, who said that I came to the Messenger of Allah 
whilst he was among the tribe of Bani Amir. And people from amongst this tribe were saying to the Prophet ﷺ the following, You are our father, you know, out of respect, and you are our chief, our Sayyid, our master. And you are the best of us. And you surpass us in excellence by you know, immense degrees. And you are an extremely generous man. And you are, and you are. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, Say what you need to, but do not get carried away by Satan. And they're saying it about the Prophet and everything they're saying is true. There's nothing they're saying is, in fact, you can say everything that they're saying doesn't even reach what it should do. But even then he's saying, be careful how much you're saying. Because why? That the Prophet is indicating that when the tongue has free reign in giving praise, even when speaking the truth, it is fair that the shaitan will lure one to excessiveness for which there is no need. Again, what I just said earlier on, which is, if you get used to speaking, you'll end up just speaking. And that part of what you're saying clearly isn't something that you've thought about. And Ibn Mas'ud, the great companion, radiallahu anhu wa arbahu, was the fifth, fifth person to become Muslim. Ibn Mas'ud, the great companion. He said, I warn you against excessive speech which would be comparable to a person who continues to speak after he has fulfilled his needs. That's it. <coughs> when you have a need that's been fulfilled, there's no need to say anything more. Now there's a very interesting um, uh, quote here from the great Tabi'i Mujahid, who says, Truly all speech is recorded to the extent that were a man to silence his son by saying such and such and such, it would be recorded as a lie. He, he mentions this example by saying, if you were to just say something to your children, which is not true, but you're saying it just to quiet them down. Look, if, if you be quiet, I'll buy you, you know, I'll take you out for dinner. <laughs> take you for an ice cream. You have no intention to, right? But you're just trying to calm him down. He said, it, it will be recorded as a lie. But you know what's really interesting about this? is that it came to me that it's, it's, we often think about um, our um, acts being recorded either in, inshallah, hopefully always in the good register and inshallah never in the bad register. But we never think about acts being recorded as being true or lies. I mean, we always just think that, oh, it's just verbatim copying of what we're saying. But how about if it's being recorded that, yeah, that's the truth, he said. Yeah, that's another truth. No, that's a lie, 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 lie. So that your register of bad deeds is just full of lies. And it says, statement X, lie. Statement Y, lie. He said this on this day, lie. <coughs> we don't think of it like that. We think it's just recorded. How do you not know it's not being recorded in correspondence to reality as well. That actually that's not true. What you're saying doesn't correspond to what, what's actually the case. Now, now look at this gem of um, the, the great Hassan. He said three, three gems of advice that he gives us. He says, the one who talks too much lies much. Number two, the one who exceedingly occupies himself with his wealth, occupies himself in acquiring sin. And number three, the one who destroys his character, destroys himself. So number one, the one who talks too much, lies much. Number two, the one who exceedingly occupies himself in his wealth, occupies himself in acquiring sin. And number three, the one who destroys his character, destroys himself because you are on your character if you destroy your character you've essentially destroyed yourself now and it's been narrated that a man spoke with the prophet salam, and continued to speak at length the prophet salam, then asked this man what else is in your mouth besides your tongue and this this man responded my lips and my teeth and the Prophet ﷺ said, Do they not help you in restraining your speech? 
right? You know, just you should be aiding yourself in, in you know, biting your tongue, right? In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said the same thing to a man who praised him and went to great lengths in his speech. The Prophet ﷺ said to this man, a man has not been given the likes of evil as a man who is excessive in his speech. So how many uh, a, a, a door of um, you know, the places that we don't want to go is opened by, is opened by the tongue? Now, and so what we find here is that the, 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 the great imams and the you know, consistent warnings, and you'll see that the imams' books are full of either hadith or verses from the Qur'an or sayings of the companions or the sayings of the salihin, the great righteous people of this ummah. Why? Because if that's how they have understood this matter to be, then we can only but follow them. And so it's said by one of the great people, Yazid bin al-Habib, uh, Abi Hadbegipan, who said that one of the tribulations of a, of a scholar is that speech becomes more beloved to him than listening. And this is a great warning for especially people who sit in this chair. In fact, there's a saying in, uh, in, in, in Arabic. They say, don't give a scholar a mic. <laughs> Because just they'll end up just being now. Of course, you know there's there's some hyperbole in that perhaps, but it's true because if a scholar becomes used to just speaking, um, and and if it's the case that he finds it difficult now to listen to other people, that's a, that's not a good sign because there's there's peace in listening to other people. There's learning in listening to other people, and so. What the Imam says in conclusion here is that um, the, the, the blameworthy nature of excessive speech um, are similar to the ones that he spoke about um, last week, where what, what is it that motivates somebody to, to speak about uh, matters that don't concern them? Um, and what, do you remember what he said? He said, it's because you just want to fill your idle talk, your time. You want to be the one who tells the stories. You, you want to be the one who has something interesting to say amongst your group. It's same, same thing here. He said it's very similar to what he spoke about in the first alpha. And he says its cure is the same as well. The cure for excessive speech is the same as the cure for what he spoke about last week. What was the cure for last week? Right, one is, he said there's two. One is just to know that, look, death is close. Where are you running to? <laughs> And the second thing he says is to uh, practice um, seclusion, right? To practice seclusion, because seclusion is the best way to to not have to speak about. Because hopefully, when you're by yourself, you're not speaking to anyone. I mean, nowadays you can be secluded far remote, remotely, and still be connected to people, right? But proper seclusion, um, because and I'll and I'll end, I'll end on this point here. Um, Khalwa uh, in Arabic means to seclude yourself. And um, the word khala, khalwa, comes from khala. And khala in Arabic means to empty yourself out. So the idea of secluding yourself is to engage in the practice of emptying your, your inner self of all that that shouldn't be there. It's a removal job, it's an emptying job. And that's the idea of seclusion, khala. And in, in our tradition, khala stands in a relationship with mala. What's mala? Mala means to be filled. And khala means to be emptied. So by going into seclusion, you're emptying yourself of the dunya, thereby preparing yourself to welcome the <coughs> blessings of Allah, mala, to be filled. In fact, the highest assembly in existence is referred to as Al Mala Al A'la. That's the name of this assembly in the heavens, Al Mala Al A'la. Right? It's the it's the greatest place that you're filled, <laughs> and that's the idea that you can you can only have you can only be a recipient of all of these great things once you've emptied yourself out of the things that shouldn't have been there in the first place. So, inshallah, we'll stop here.